Our first floor walls are fully built and they are square plumb and true. So now it's time to go vertical. It's time to build on up. Now we don't have stairs in this house yet for getting up and down to the deck and we don't have really any way to get to where the joists are going to be located except from ladders and scaffolding or in this case catwalks. Now very often in carpentry and especially in this house you're going to see us build walkways and platforms and catwalks and scaffolding. Temporary structures that we can use to work off of while we build the house. That's what this catwalk is. Now the second floor of this house will be built from BCI joists that are very similar to the ones we used in the first floor. These are just a little stiffer, a slightly larger section on the flanges, and are represented to be more rigid and more suitable for a longer span, like we have in the area that will be under the master bedroom upstairs. Now on the edges they will rest on the exterior walls, and in a few places inside the footprint of the house they will sit in joist hangers that are hanging from beams. Daniel is fastening these hangers to the beam that will span the living room while he's standing on the ground outside the house. I try and do as much of this sort of work as possible on the ground. Now not necessarily I guess as much as possible but as much as makes sense. That means layout and hangers, drilling if at all possible, nailing if there are ways to do it. Try to do these things in some position other than leaning out over the edge of a ladder or holding yourself up with one hand and standing on a brace and nailing. Those kinds of things don't always work out just the way you want them to. So do it on the ground if you can. This beam will support the floor joists that span the master bedroom in the upstairs. We've marked the correct location on the crown plate and are slowly easing it into position. There are six by six posts under each end of this beam holding it up. And one of those is resting directly on top of the beam that we placed in the crawl space. All of the heavy loads in this house are transferred straight down to the foundation in one way or another. The plans make it very clear where these beams go and what size these beams need to be. The plans don't tell you exactly where to attach the joists, but it's easy enough to figure out the layout because the spacing is specified on the, on the plans, and there's really only one way to make that two-foot spacing work. The board on the outside that you see us establishing flush to the outside edge of the wall is called a rim joist or a rim board and you will get a good look at that a little later. You can think of it kind of like a little beam though because while the joists that sit just inside of it and are nailed to it are carrying the floor load out in the middle of the space, this rim joist is actually carrying most of the compressive load of the wall that will sit on the deck directly above it. 
The floor joists are just there to hold up the floor, not the weight of the walls and the roof and that sort of thing. Now rolling these joists out is a lot like the ones on the first floor. It just goes a little slower since we are up in the air. Now I didn't cut these floor joists off all at once like I did on the first floor and for a couple of reasons. First, there are a few different lengths happening on our second floor and it would not have been as easy as it was on the ground floor with just one nice uniform cut. Second, it's very valuable to me to have all these joists up here in one place at one time like this. When they are not cut, when they are in the unit the way they come from the mill, they are stuck together pretty tight. And it's pretty easy to move them around and raise them and transport them with the forklift and stick them where you want them and set them down without having them rattle apart and make a big mess. And they balance nicely on these partitions. This would have been a bit more complicated if they were all cut. Cutting individual joists one at a time is a little slow but it's certainly doable, and in this case, I felt like it was the better option. Let me point out these posts, 4x6, Douglas fir. I've got a 6x6 over there. We're going to have probably a dozen posts scattered around through this house by the time it's done. And they're all transferring loads, point loads, from up above to down below. In the case of these two posts, they are centered directly over the floor beam. You remember the beam that went in between the two pony walls with the posts down to the footings? So the loads that go on these posts are transferred to the strip footings that are down on the compacted subgrade down below. A post is in compression parallel to the grain. That is, you're trying to shorten the post and resisting the, <laughs> you're trying to shorten the tree. This is a little portion of the tree and you're trying to shorten it by squishing it lengthways. It's not gonna happen. Douglas fir is really strong in that direction. So not only is it functioning like the stud where it's holding the sheetrock on this side and the sheetrock on this side and it has to stay straight but it's functioning to hold up this beam we've got another beam in the floor system that is reducing the span of those wooden i-beams so that the floor is not springy in the master bedroom so as part of this fully integrated functioning system that this house is going to be we have 
posts and beams and posts and beams working all the way up to the peak of the roof. It's just so cool. Now I got one other thing to point out. These are called pressure blocks. I've got them at the bottom and I've got them at the top. They're overkill. But I just thought, you know, if this post would ever decide to twist for any reason, you put those pressure blocks in there so that if it wants to twist, it has to slide those pressure blocks out of the way. Pressure blocks are an easy, sort of a low impact way to add strength and add sort of a, an extra layer of sturdiness. Not every wall in a house is bearing any sort of a serious load. Some walls are just holding up the sheetrock and that's it. Some walls are holding up a, a distributed load clear across the length of the wall, a load bearing wall. And some walls like this one have a couple of point loads, big loads pushing down in one spot and the rest of the wall is just holding up the drywall. We're gonna have a complete study or a, a video that talks about this, I hope, exhaustively coming up. The difference between the exterior walls and the loads that they're holding and the interior walls and the loads that they're holding and how you maybe can recognize that perhaps or at least new ways to think about it when you're thinking about whether a wall in your house might be carrying a load or not. So we've got two more posts down here. This one is where it's going to stay. This one has to move just a little bit. There's another one that's got to go in where we tie where the garage ties back into this end of the house is just really fairly tricky transferring the loads from that garage ridge down onto the beam that's underneath here. So posts happen, beams happen, bearing is important. The last thing we want is drywall cracking and creaking sounds in the middle of the night. We want this house to stand here straight and strong for a good long time. And the components of this framing package are ample to make sure that that happens. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman and for being part of our series here and for leaving the great comments and feedback and for sharing and mentioning our videos to your friends and family and co-workers. And please, keep up the good work.